How to make a vintage Bassett Lope steam plant work again, part 5. Fixing the leaking flange bolt, making an inlet pipe for the water pump, making the exhaust collector and a surprise at the end. First of all, I removed the bolt on the right hand side, the one that was leaking, and then I used some Loctite 542 to seal the hole where the bolt was, and here's the bolt going back into place with some more Loctite 542 on it. It's a bit of a Loctite 542 overdose, but with a bit of luck, it won't leak anymore. In the last video, I got something wrong. I'm really sorry about this. I think I said that these were 6BA bolts. Well, they're not. They're 7BA bolts, which is even smaller. So as I'm tightening them up, I'm being very careful not to strip the thread. In this clip, it may look that I'm putting excessive pressure on the bolts, but I'm not. Now it's time for another steam test. I'm using some methylated spirits to fill the tank. I don't know what they've done with methylated spirits. It never used to be like this. There was a dye in it, but the dye didn't stay in the bench if you spill it on the bench, and it didn't stay in your fingers. Very, very strange. I think for the next lot, I'll try a different brand. In no time at all, this boiler reaches working pressure, and there's steam in abundance. You can hear the safety valve blowing off in the previous clip. And in fact, if you listen, it's still blowing off. It's making a hissing noise. And even though the safety valve's blowing off, the pressure gauge remains at a constant level. Over now to the small water pump. Although it worked okay, I didn't like the inlet union. It was a bit of a special size. So I drilled out the casting to 7 30 seconds of an inch, which is tapping size for quarter by 40. Then using a quarter by 40 tap, I threaded the hole to take one of these commercial unions like this. Then I thought, instead of this commercial union, maybe I should just put this piece of pipe on like this. But then I thought, no, it's going to stick over the edge of the baseboard. Instead, I used a PM Research Union. I buy these from time to time from a company in England called Forest Classics. The details of these elbows are on screen at the moment. PM Research are an American company and make some really nice things. I had an old piece of plywood kicking about in the workshop, so as a temporary measure, I sat the parts on this piece of plywood to try and figure out the best position for the different units on the baseboard. Because I'd like the engine to be a bit closer to the boiler than it was previously when it was first pulled off the original baseboard, I'm temporarily fitting a commercial steam union to the steam inlet. I will pipe this up in due course. In this clip, I'm making the exhaust collector. And for this, I'm using a piece of brass bar, and in the current clip on screen, I'm marking out the holes. And these are at one inch centres to accept the outlet pipes from the cylinders. So I cut it to size, and now I'm drilling the cross holes in it. These holes are at one inch centres, and the first thing I would always do is use a centre drill. I could have used a centre punch, but there's no point. I can get the position perfectly using a centre drill in the drilling machine. Once again, a lot of practice and the calibrated eye does come in useful. After drilling the pilot holes in the piece of bar, it's time to put it in the lathe to face off each end. I'm doing this job in the larger of my two lathes. This is my old Smart and Brown lathe, and this lathe is fitted with a four-jaw self-centering chuck, a very useful thing for turning square section material, as well as round material, but not too good for hexagon. So for hexagon and round material, I often use the small Boxford lathe at the other side of the workshop. After drilling a pilot hole with a centre drill, I then put a drill through the centre which is 7 30 seconds of an inch in diameter. And I don't want to drill all the way through this piece of metal, that's why I drilled the pilot holes first, because you can hear when the drill breaks through the pilot hole. I heard it break through the first one, and I've just heard it break through the second one. The tone changes. That stops me accidentally going all the way through. Here I'm using a quarter by 40 threads per inch taper tap. I'm threading the first three eighths of an inch of this hole to accept a union. I often use the lathe under power for tapping, but I'm running the lathe at a slower speed to do this. The next job, and the final job in the lathe, is to turn the piece of bar round and face across the end of it. You'll notice that the lathe is now running fast again for this operation. Some viewers will also notice the small pip on the end of the work. This means that the centre height of the tool is incorrect. It should be a little bit higher. But unlike one viewer who made a comment, I do not work to a tenth of a thou. That would be a little bit excessive. This is definitely not a high precision component. I'll be cleaning it up on the belt sander so it will be fine as it is. 
You will notice that the drill grabbed as it broke through into the centre hole. You have to be careful about this. You can damage the drill or snap the drill, but not in this case, it worked okay. Most of the time, twist drills will tend to grab as the drill emerges through the other end of the piece of metal. And this is particularly bad in brass and copper. It's terrible drilling copper. After finishing the drilling and cleaning up the piece of brass using my belt sander, I then soft soldered the collector to the end of the original exhaust pipes. Soft solder is sufficient for exhaust collectors. It's not good on steam inlets. You must never use soft solder for any high pressure live steam lines because the temperature of the steam will melt the solder. That's okay for small steam toys that run at 15 pounds per square inch, but for larger high pressure models, you must use silver solder on the live steam inputs. As shown here, I used another PM Research elbow to screw into the end of the exhaust collector. And to fit the elbow onto the exhaust collector, I just made a simple piece of threaded tube, quarter by 40. And now it looks like this. I think I like the effect really. It's a square exhaust collector because the base of the engine, the modified base of the engine, is also pretty square, so they sort of match. And I have the option of rotating the exhaust elbow, either leaving it like this, turning it upwards, or turning it down should I need to pipe the exhaust through the baseboard. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned a surprise. No, I'm not going to set fire to myself. Here's the surprise. The engine originally came with this generator, and this was painted by a 12-year-old boy, apparently, who was now in his 50s. Now, as you know, I like steam engines to be green, occasionally black, and occasionally crimson lake. Never red and yellow. But don't ask me why. The generator looks quite good in red and yellow, so I think I may keep this in red and yellow. The previous owner of the plant said that it was built by a man who had an amusement arcade. So yes, it looks very fairground-like, but often these were used in fairgrounds. The problem with this generator is it's a bit knackered, it doesn't work. It's a mechanical problem, there's too much end float on the shaft. So the first job is to get the pulley off, I wish. The pulley has been put on with some sort of Loctite product. So we'll have to remove that very carefully using some heat in the outer part of my workshop where the gas bottle is. And sure enough, a bit of heat persuaded the pulley to part company with the shaft. I'm not going to cover the repair of this in this episode. I'll do that as a separate episode entirely. And for now, the partially dismantled generator is in a plastic box awaiting restoration. That's it for now. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.